at soy at soy at soy Who's the most fun to drink with <laughs> of the Republican <laughs> lawmakers? At soy at soy at soy at soy Todd also confirmed that Robin Voss has virtually no sense of humor. <laughs> You can always let us know if you are drinking with lawmakers at 844-967-2789. Moving Wisconsin forward one joke at a time, this is Kristen Bry with As Goes Wisconsin. Yada, yada, yada. Hello, Wisconsin! Hello, Wisconsin. Welcome to the 11 o'clock hour of As Goes Wisconsin. I am your host, Kristen Bry. And on the board today, we got Mr. Greg Bach. Hello. Uh, Jane is out, but she's doing well. No need to worry. No. 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 But we guess miss what? her. Guess we do what? miss her. We miss her and we love her. And when we hear that laugh. Oh, my God. That there's laugh. nothing better than a, a, a organic, guttural yep. laugh from yes. Jane when I really get to make her laugh is makes like, you feel funny it does yeah it does trying to do this show with a silent producer and then obviously no audience because i come from even though i'm not a stand-up like you are a stand-up i've done yeah. some stand-up but i certainly grew up doing theater yeah and there is something about having the live audience to tell you to like have check in with mm -hmm. be like all right i'm doing okay yeah versus the are these jokes landing <laughs> in this <laughs> silence so the litmus test they're being, just jokes did I, people did i make jane laugh is uh is typically a good one but uh welcome back to the show i don't know if uh your social media looked anything like mine over the weekend or if you part were involved in any of some of the protests or demonstrations that happened but on saturday marked uh, a year since the roe versus wade reversal happened and in many states including wisconsin we reverted to basically a complete ban of abortions and for some people maybe it hasn't really affected their life at all and for others this has been absolutely devastating um and so, you know, even after a leaked draft alerting the country of the decision a month before it came down how exactly abortion access would change our own the country was still an open question. And now a year in, here's kind of where we're at. So 25 states have passed new abortion restrictions in the past year. And of those, 13 have passed near, near to total or total abortion bans, some with no exceptions for rape or incest at all. On the flip side, 20 states have passed laws protect protecting abortion rights, uh, but being a safe haven for abortion seekers can come with its own challenges. Planned Parenthood of Illinois saw a 54% spike in new patients over the last year. And one clinic in Kansas City received so many out-of-state patients that it's only able to help 10 to 15% of people who are seeking abortions at its facility. And it's hard to, <laughs> it's hard to keep track what's legal where. Um, because since the beginning of 2023, 700 bills concerning abortion, about half of those aiming to restrict it, half hoping to protect it, have been introduced in state legislatures. And that's just this year. And I kind of, my take on this when this came down last year, and my my journal sentinel video for this of like was this was because it was the law of the land and now you know what their stated intention was at first which i think has been disproven is like oh it should be a state decision and the amount of litigation and lawsuits and deciphering of what does that mean is it has introduced chaos and chaos at the expense of women's health and i say this as like when this first came down you know this was june of 20 last year i was getting married in august and i knew that pretty quickly after getting married we were going to try to start having a baby and i also knew that once you're past 35 you become uh, a geriatric pregnancy which mm -hmm. is so fun just so fun to be referred to as but immediately you become a higher risk pregnancy. And so living 
for me personally, living in a state where I knew that I was going to try to get pregnant, it was going to be a wanted pregnancy. I didn't know how hard it was going to be for me. I didn't know if they were there and some places are coming after like IVF and stuff like that next. But also if there was any complications, what that would mean. And I knew, you know, it's like, ultimately I have enough income and resources that this was never going to be like, it was going to be an obstacle, but it wouldn't be life-threatening. Like if something were to happen and this has been my experience, even as I've kind of held my breath at every doctor's appointment I've had since becoming pregnant in uh, January, um, finding out in February, um, you know, of holding my breath and making sure everything's okay. And that needing to go to Chicago isn't going to be, have to be an option because that, that is the option now for women who have wanted pregnancies where something happens and they can't have their doctors at home help them because those doctors run the risk of being prosecuted. And Vice had a really good roundup of, I'm sure it's not even all of them, but of stories that have, that have, we've made headlines of how much this has impacted women's health and individual stories across the country. And, you know, we're at the point now where around 66,000 people were unable to get abortions in their home state, according to data that was released um, from the Society of Family Planning. And more than 30%, no, 30,000 seemed unable to get legal abortions at all. And so what happened with those people is not really known. Like, did they leave the country? Did they induce on their own? Did they simply stay pregnant? And like, likely there's never going to be a full accounting for that, but there are stories. And I will link to that vice story to our show notes today. Cause I don't, I also don't think it makes good radio for me to run through all of them, but it's the amount of women who have stories like entering 18 weeks of pregnancy and having your water break, but there's still a heartbeat. And so the doctors make it clear that like, there's no, there's no chance you're going to be able to give birth to a healthy baby, but we can't do anything. This was a story in Missouri and, you know, basically she had to try to go to Kansas, try to go to Illinois. And she ultimately, so she had to go from Missouri to Illinois to finally get any kind of medical attention for her unviable pregnancy. And, you know, this has raised issues with digital privacy and like the links that certain lawmakers are willing to go to prosecute people because in Nebraska, they charged a 17 year old and her mother with multiple felonies and misdemeanors after the pair allegedly conspired to for Celeste abortion. And they did this by, by basically going through getting the, like get going through her private Facebook chats and that was legal. And so like the digital privacy has become an entire thing. Crossing state lines has become a thing. You know, in Wisconsin, we had a woman who was who bled for 10 days after hospital staff refused to remove fetal tissue from her, from her incomplete miscarriage. And another one, an Ohio woman was sent home from the hospital after a miscarriage, still bleeding and without medical attention. Another woman who lived in Ohio was blocked from getting an abortion in the state even after tests revealed that her fetus had kidney failure and heart defects. Continuing the pregnancy would put her life at risk. So the woman traveled to Michigan for an abortion. And it's just like it's stories like this where it doesn't seem to be getting any clearer and there doesn't seem to be any priority as far as giving making these guidelines less vague so doctors know what they can and cannot do. Because conservatives are convinced that, like, well, they w- they want to redefine abortion, right? Like that was introduced in Wisconsin's legislature. Is like, well, when it's a medical, when it's for medical reasons, it's not actually an abortion, but it is because med- an abortion is a medical procedure, and it's just at the expense of women potentially dying, having to be on the brink of death, losing their baby, losing their uterus, because a lot of t- there's many times that this ends so badly that they have to have an emergency hysterectomy and then their ability to even have another baby comes and like in the name of squabbling and it's incredibly sad. And I think, I don't know if it's going to take 
Janet Protasiewicz being on the court for things to get settled here. But like, it doesn't feel like we're any closer in this state to getting to a better solution, despite the fact that more than 60 percent of Americans think that overturning Roe was a bad thing, according to polling from from Gallup. And 69 percent of Americans, a record high, also believe that abortion should be legal in the first trimester of pregnancy. And yet here we are. It's where we're always going to be with all these hot button issues, abortion, gun rights, voting, overall majority of the people say yes to like the freedoms, the privacy, the all the things that we believe as Americans we should have. But here comes Congress telling us they know better or here comes the assembly or the state Senate because they know better. Well, and what's so frustrating about this is the the myriad of ways and exceptions and scenarios that when you try to get into this kind of debate with someone yeah. that you can throw out of like, well, what if it's a fetal anomaly? What if she the water breaks? What if like all of these different things? What if it's rape? If it's incest, who takes care of the baby? Because like simultaneously you hear people say, as I did last week, don't have kids if you can't afford them. But it's like, well, I'm trying not to. Yeah. And yet you're telling me I have to. And it's almost like because, you know, you try to, I would think that the best policy is don't legislate for exceptions, mm -hmm. legislate for the rule. Yeah. And when it comes to people's health, it's so many individual cases that the chaos that has ensued is because you can't legislate all of these different scenarios. No. Like how how do you measure how close a woman has to be to death to say? Now you can do it. And who's supposed to, Robin Voss is supposed to, all these guys who are like landlords, they're the ones, they're the ones who are supposed to tell us like, well, this makes sense to me. Like these, none of these people who are making these laws, or I would say most of them, don't have medical backgrounds. And they're the ones who get to decide like, where's the line? Ugh. So. Take your advice from the popcorn king of Wisconsin, Robin Voss. <laughs> All right. Well, that's my rant for today. But um, when we come back, something happened in Russia over the weekend. Yeah, it did. Yeah, it did. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I don't even think I fully understand the whole thing, but we're going to try to parse through what happened in like a 36 hour span that uh, captured at least a lot of people online's attention. This is As Goes Wisconsin. We'll be right back. Call me a murderer. Now that's hate. AM WAUK has a new lineup. Four to six. Ukraina, Ukraina, снова до нас поперлася мискальня. Казав, що ви на парад Київ іде, любим сусідам русський мир принесе. Не Владимир, не Владимир, брешеш ти у всьому світу, що ти за мир. Не Владимир. Welcome back to As Goes Wisconsin. I am Kristen Bry. He is Greg Bach coming in with the theme music for this segment. Um, <laughs> you're welcome. You're thank you for that. That is, uh, I just made me want to wish I could. What's the move? What's the Russian dance move when they're like squatting and then they're, they're kicking? It's like it's called a Russian squat kick. No, it's not. I know it's not. But you know what I'm talking about when it's like they're it's like the Russian dancers and they it's kind of like the yeah. Yeah. Kick line, but they're it's very athletic. I could never do it. Okay. I tried. Okay. Not good. Not good. <laughs> fell on your tuchus? Fell on my coccyx. <laughs> <laughs> do I have to dump off for that? Oh my God. <laughs> All right. So uh if you know what you know, the, the term TLDR typically means too long, don't read. But in this case, uh too long didn't revolt. So <laughs> I I got wind of this, I think, just casually through social media. Because I don't know, I was checking things on online, but basically, in a 36 hour period this weekend, a private Russian mercenary army denounced their country's leadership, caravan towards Moscow in an act of open revolt, then agreed to a truce that ended the host hostilities almost as quickly as they began. And basically, one Twitter person, which is actually pretty funny, said this coup could have been an email. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so while it was uh you know shorter than a test cricket match 
Deep people. cut. Uh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. The mutiny, supposedly now the mutiny, I don't know, because some people are now saying this was fake news entirely that was like planted to throw off Ukrainians. But some people are also saying the mutiny where is going to leave like a long term stain for Putin and have exposed him to threats that he's never faced in like the 20 years he's been leading Russia. And so have you did you follow this much, Greg? Oh, he's all right. We're taking a call right now. Um, but so basically on Friday, the businessman who leads the Wagner and I didn't know these are this is all new. These are new names to me. I am not a like geopolitical um, savant where I, I know who the major players are and all of this stuff. So this is stuff that I am reading and trying to relay as far as it making sense. But so Wagner, there's a Wag, Wagner private army for Russia and Yejevny Prigozhin, which I think how you pronounce his name. And it dramatically, so he dramatically escalated this long simmering feud with the country's military leadership. And he was posting messages on Telegram, which is, I don't, I don't use Telegram, so I don't even know how that works. And has accused Russia's defense minister of bombing his troops. So he announced a, quote, march for justice against the Russian defense system. So as Prigozhin and his Wagner army marched toward Moscow, Russia charged him with mounting an open rebellion. And then like bizarre scenes of everyday life coming with like armed revolt in a major Russian city. And like this was spreading across social media. Leaders in Ukraine and the West, like, don't, like, they said they'd rather have, like, Prigozhin, like, I think they were, like, trying to decide, like, Prigozhin or Putin, like, which one would they have, but both, like, don't necessarily seem like a good thing as far as just the, in general, instability. So then basically, based after being on the cusp of civil war on Saturday, the two sides agreed to a truce that would send Prigozhin to Belarus in exchange for amnesty, and Wagner troops would stand down from their march on Moscow. So like crisis averted, but uh, <laughs> it's like a very weird thing to be uh, like that close to civil war and then just be like, all right, well, I guess it's over. And so um, Greg, did you follow this much? All I heard is that it, it, the only things I could get out of it was like some of the higher ups in Russia were kind of like, yeah, we're going to, we're gonna go home. We're we're good. Wrap this up. Yeah, like people were like leaving the country. Yeah, just like <laughs> so. That's what I mean. Like that's why I feel like I can't. It it wasn't unless that also was fake news. Because I think that's the thing. Like ultimately, and this is hard for me as a trusting person. But like, because as far as I understand, like Putin owns the media there. Absolutely. And so it's like my brother was more on the side of even as this was all unraveling, mm -hmm. being like, "There's a chance that this is like planted and just." you know, it, misinformation or disinformation to like coax the Ukrainians into thinking that Russia is weaker than it is and all of this stuff. And I was like, this is... <laughs> yeah, because the Ukrainians are really going to buy it. Like, oh, really? Let's go outside. It's over. But my favorite, my favorite on all of this is, especially when people start getting, becoming experts on anything, is then like subsequently the the tweets and the the people who make fun of them is being like, you went from in like a 36 hour period, you went from being a expert on uh, submersibles and really giving <laughs> your two cents on what should have been happening with the, uh, with the Titan in, yeah. and Ocean Gate into now being a geo geopolitical expert on Ukrainian Russian warfare and all of the inner workings as far as this, uh, this revolution is happening. If you just do your research, Kristen, do your research. <laughs> And so that's the thing. And it's funny because it, it makes me think of this is a key point of why I think for many reasons. But, you know, when we've talked about this blue checkmark thing on Twitter and now what's happened is as you're what was still a dumpster, always been a dumpster fire in one way or another Twitter. But like at one point, it was the best place to get up to the minute real time information as major world news was breaking like a potential civil war in russia and now it's not that those updates aren't still happening but there's not an ability to know unless you are you've curated your twitter feed and you really know who you trust and who you don't trust but like as things populate the blue check mark means nothing right it doesn't mean that you're you're listening to someone who's like a verified expert in what they're talking about or a verified news outsource outlet of a, that knows what they're talking about it has verified the information but before they're putting it out and so like the amount of stuff that comes out that you just kind of have to be like 
then do more research to even know who that person is that's making that claim feels like not worth it. It's like, I'll just wait till the New York Times writes their, <laughs> their update about this whole situation. All right. When we come back, Dr. Bryce Smith will be here to tell us some stories about the history, some just historical stories of LGBTQ people in Milwaukee, in Wisconsin. Love it. Stick around. This is going to be really fun. This is As Goes Wisconsin. There's a shadow in everybody's front door when I am her. There's a top Welcome back to As Goes Wisconsin. I am Kristen Bry. We got Greg Bach on the board. And I'm so excited to talk to our next guest. Dr. Bryce Smith is a fantastic historian who leads LGBTQ or LGBT Milwaukee Project, which we'll get more about that uh, later. But and he's recently been expanding his efforts into recording and telling stories uh, of history of the Black LGBTQ plus community in Milwaukee. And I'm so excited to hear more stories from him. Welcome to the show, Dr. Bryce. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to talk with you as well. Yes. So I guess let's start with the basics of, and it's hard to. Besides just emphasizing it with my voice, but how it's uh, how it's spelled. But what is LGBT Milwaukee? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we put the walk in Milwaukee. Um, it's you know, in short, it's a historic walking tour app. Uh, we officially launched it last summer uh, in June, and we launched with twenty five sites, and we've recently added four more this year. Um, basically, and, and the reason this whole thing came into being is because I was invited to be a speaker at the 60th anniversary commemorating the Black Knight Brawl. And several of us were invited to, to speak at this event. And we're all just standing there in this like huge empty lot downtown, right? Including at the time Mayor Barrett. And he's, you know, as he was talking, he was saying, you know what, I have lived in Milwaukee my whole life. I had no idea of the history that transpired here. I go by this place every day. No idea. And, you know, it was was just such a, a poignant statement. And, you know, I was very much feeling the same way. Like, here we are in this just, you know, like trash filled lot looking around and you know, there's there's no like visible mark of the history that was made here, and there were, were no marks anywhere in the entire city. I mean, there was no like physical evidence of the the literal mark that we had left on the city mm-hmm. as a community. And I just I really wanted to create something so that everyone could see the different places that we made history, the different sites of historic significance, um, to be able to start sharing some of our, our stories in compelling ways, ways that resonated with people, but also in a, in a really personal and accessible way, right? So that mm-hmm. everyone could always have our history in the palm of their hands, like no matter where they went. Um, so I recruited local LGBTQ talent, um, everybody who works on the project is is a part of the community, and you know it it ended up being even greater than I imagined. Just bringing in all these super talented folks, and we're able to launch it in June to a great fanfare, which is awesome. Of history. So it's a free app. So basically, <laughs> it's a free app. You can download. You can find it in both the Apple down uh, App Store and the Google Play. And it basically, as you walk around the city, in the same way, I guess sometimes when there's like physical, actual little plaques that from Wisconsin Historical Society, that's like this building was blah, blah, blah. Like this is what that is, except you'd have to read your app and then look at the building and be like, oh, this happened here, right? Yep, yep, that's right. And what we did though, we wanted to, you know, because I'm all about making history as accessible and as interesting as possible because. You know, I've experienced firsthand the power of history in shaping my life. So what we did too is that, you know, we didn't just want it to be kind of your your typical walking tour, you know, where you just kind of listen and, and you have someone, you know, kind of monotone, just blah, 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 you know, kind of telling the story. We wanted it to be more of like an experience. Okay. So for each of the sites, we actually produced what I like to refer to as mini documentaries. 
So they're anywhere from like three to five minutes long. And we use different pictures, either from the actual events or people that we're talking about, or else contemporary pictures to help tell the story. But it, it basically ends up creating this feeling of, you know, like basically if you're sitting in your gay uncle's basement watching old slideshows, right? And, and hearing him tell the stories of what occurred at these various locations. So you can actually walk there and, you know, do the actual walking tours and go to the sites themselves, you know, which can be a powerful experience. Like, you know, as I was sharing, like with the, with the Black Knight, right? The fact that it is now an empty lot like that, you know, can really, you know, be a powerful thing. Um, you know, the fact that you can't even see the building that used to be there, that it has literally, our history has literally been erased from there. So, you know, you can either walk to the sites and experience them in that way, or, or I like to joke that it's an all-weather app. So if, <laughs> if it's cold and snowy outside, you could also just hang out at home and binge watch all of the, the mini documentaries that we produce. <laughs> so I actually have to claim ignorance. I don't know what the Black Knight Brawl is. So that's what you reference is like that was kind of the inspirational point of talking about that, like commemorating that event. Uh, but I don't. What is, what what is the Black Knight Brawl? <laughs> well, I would be happy to tell you. <laughs> um, it was actually the uh, the first LGBTQ uprising in Wisconsin, and also one of the first in the U.S. And don't worry, you are not alone in not knowing about it. We've you know been working really hard in the past couple of years to help share this story because it is so inspiring, and also you know. It's, it's, it's of great historical significance. And basically what happened was in August of 1961, four sailors were dared to go to this gay bar known as the Black Knight. So they, they went there, and as they were trying to get in the door, right, the gay bars at the time, you know, we tried to have some method of, of gatekeeping to try to ensure that the patrons could be protected, mm -hmm. right? Like, so there was a bouncer at the door who asked to see their IDs and also asked them to sign the sheet of paper to come in. Well, the sailors didn't like that. They got into a bit of a tussle with the bouncer and Josie Carter came to the bouncer's rescue. Now, Josie at the time identified as a queen. Um, today, we would probably describe her as being non-binary. Um, she was a, a black queen. She came to his defense, <laughs> took out her heels, uh, went after these, these guys. They ran off, vowing to come back and really raise heck, right? So meanwhile, as they're, you know, licking their wounds and, you know, trying to, to get some more courage, um, Josie rounds up members of the community, like 70 plus members of the community, right? At, at the time, there were very few public spaces that queer and trans people had access to. So the bars were one of these you know, rare places, not only in our city, but you know, all across the country, where we could go and, and be ourselves and also meet others like us. So, you know, when, when a, a space like that feels threatened, you know, you just, you, you want to defend your home at all costs, right? It was, it was just this, this refuge. Mm -hmm. So she rallied the troops and these sailors came back and were met with a mob. <laughs> and, uh, the melee ensued and the police came and actually arrested the sailors. And this became an event that inspired the gay community moving forward. Um, kind of became a, a flashpoint for some of the organizing that was going on here in Milwaukee and across the state. You know, people saw this covered in a newspaper. There were articles about it. And, you know, at the, at the time, people were used to gay people, you know, trying to hide, um, you know, like trying not to, to get arrested or caught and having their names printed in the newspaper because they might lose their jobs. Well, in this case, you know, here were folks who were fighting back and, mm -hmm. you know, saying, hey, we, we have a right to the city. We have a right to our space, too. And here we are. So it's not unlike Stonewall. Totally. Like yeah. as but far as like it's, it's not so much. I mean, earlier, yes. But I'm just saying as far as like, like protecting yep. our space and like saying enough is enough. 
happening at a bar. Like it's 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 so many parallels to the story that I think is, you know, we get told more. But to f- know that that happened in Milwaukee, where w- what neighborhood was Black Knight in? Sure. Um, well, it it's down around like the Milwaukee Public Market. Okay. So basically, like where St. Paul kind of ends. Um, right there. And, and it's now the, they're building a distillery there. Uh, the, the from Neiman family, the dog park, I used to it was kind of that area. Yeah, 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 of course. Um, so they are actually now building stuff up on the site, uh, which is exciting. And, you know, what, what I love about the story of the Black Knight too, is you're absolutely right. It has so many similarities to what happened with Stonewall, but I also love the fact that unlike Stonewall, right, where the patrons were the ones who got arrested. In this instance, the sailors got arrested. Yeah. And the reason why is because Josie was friends with the police and the police knew that she was telling the truth. So they came in there and, you know, wanted to help defend Josie with their friends with and the rest of the community, which I think is just amazing. That is um, definitely a twist and, to and a story. Something that <laughs> yeah, is, seriously. Right? Well, I want to make sure we have time because on top of so LGBT Milwaukee is an app for Milwaukee, but you are also involved in the PBS Wisconsin Pride uh series that is out now. And so that and that has more history about pride his I mean not pride, LGBT his, history across the state, correct? It does. Yes. Yep. And I was invited to participate in the documentary and it's just amazing i i highly recommend it to everybody you can stream it online just go to pbs.org and look up wisconsin pride and the reason i was invited to participate was to speak about lou sullivan who is a world-renowned trans activist and author from wawatosa and and also from milwaukee he was involved with the gay liberation movement here um, I've actually published Lou's biography. It's titled Lou Sullivan, Daring to Be a Man Among Men. And Lou is actually the reason why I became an historian. Um, wow. I came across him. <laughs> I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, yeah, I was, uh, you know, I, I took a history course on a, on a whim and, you know, I was going through the library trying to find a topic for my final paper and, you know, I, I came across him in, in one of the books on the shelves, and I just started like going through all of them, trying to find more, and became frustrated that I couldn't find out more information about him. So I decided to, uh, you know, if I was so frustrated that his biography didn't exist, then you know, I figured, well, then I might as well write it. Um, <laughs> Take initiative. But, uh, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes, I pursued my PhD in history to uh, uh, to be able to tell his story, and it was in the process of you know researching his story and writing about it that I actually came to understand and embrace my own identity as a trans man. And I figured, you know what, if if this guy could do it, then why can't I? And I just drew so much courage from you know, from his his story and the ways in which he overcame his challenges that, you know, I just, I experienced firsthand the power of history and it, it, you know, it changed my life. And so I've been wanting to share this gift with others ever since. Oh, this, <laughs> this, this, so this, this is such, there were so many frustrating things we talked about earlier in the show. This is making me so happy. So I guess we only have two minutes left before we have to let you go, Dr. Bryce, but I guess as we come to the end of this Pride Month, and I feel like this Pride Month has felt different than recent years because of how many attacks, legal attacks there are across the country on trans rights, on the LGBTQ community overall. And so as far as things to take through, that things that are so celebrated during Pride to keep with us throughout the year, what would your advice on that be for, for our listeners? Yeah, just the, you know, we're your neighbors, you know, and uh, um, just that, you know, that, that um, just to, to learn as much as you can about those who came before us to know that we've always been here um, and that, you know, we, we keep finding ways to persevere and to do so with, with style and flair and, um and you know that that we 
would not have realized all the gains that we have were it not for our allies. So thank you, everyone who loved us and uh, for seeing for seeing who we are and realizing that the world is a is a better place with us. And it's the media. I'm meteorologist here. Bye. Welcome back to As Goes Wisconsin. I am Kristen Bry. He is Greg Bach. And unfortunately, we hit the hit the commercial mark with Dr. Bryce Smith, who is a historian and one of the leaders and uh, innovators of LGBT Milwaukee. And also you can be seen on uh, the Wisconsin, the PBS's Wisconsin Pride series, docuseries. Um, but want to we'll link all of that in today's show notes because uh, there's lots to check out there. And I think he makes such a great point that there is, it's kind of how sometimes I feel like about black history in Wisconsin, that there's so much there that we don't learn in school. Yep. Absolutely. Oh my gosh, and yes. when you hear those stories and you realize how much has happened in Wisconsin and in Milwaukee, um, it's really cool to learn about. And I was talking to Dr. Dr. Smith or Bryce uh, off air, and he said that he'd love to come back to talk about more about black LGBTQ and trans yeah. history and things like that. Uh, unfortunately, we did get cut off, but wonderful conversation made me smile, made me feel good. And it's just, I, I, I love it. I love it. I know. And, you know, one of the things I think the music was starting to play them out off, but I had an experience. I don't think I talked about this on air, but two weekends ago, I went to a wedding. It was a gay wedding, mm -hmm. good friends of ours. And, you know, I didn't think twice about it because they're my friends and that's what you do. You, when you get invited to a wedding, you go. Yeah. And it was, per, I would say 90% of the attendees, uh, the, the, the guests were also gay. And at the end of the night, obviously, uh, I was the end of the night, they ended up at, this is it. Like that was the after party for the wedding. Oh yeah, of course. Um, but I had one of their friends come up to me and I was like, obviously pregnant and he, I had never met him before. And he just like thanked Mike and I for even being there. Oh my gosh. And it it was something that I just take for granted because I'm like, well, they're my friends. Of course I would be yeah. here. But he just, he so sincerely said like in this time and the state of the country right now to have straight people show up and celebrate us means more than you can possibly know. He goes, and then to know that you two are bringing a kid into the world who's going to have your values yeah. means even more. And I just like immediately start crying. <laughs> but I think it's something for so many of us to remember coming out of Pride Month, which is, you know, it's like it's parades and it's fun and it's parties and it's rainbows. But ultimately, like, this is a reality for people year round. And I don't think anything's going to it's going to start feeling more safe anytime soon with the rhetoric that we keep hearing from certain conservatives and certain conservative groups and just letting women's sports and protecting women's sports be the scapegoat. And that's totally a, a, a red herring. Yeah. Um, the fight never stops. Yeah. And I think it's just as people who walk through life, you, who don't have to think about those things, mm -hmm. like remember how like the little things of showing up throughout the year. Yeah. Like I didn't think I didn't think twice about that, but like it matters. Yeah. And so that's it. You're showing up and you're standing up. You're doing something about it. you're putting the and you're putting these topics on your show. You could easily not put them on your show either. That's true. And you're and 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 I, you know, as someone as part of the community, I thank you for that. How do you feel after your first show? I'm feel I'm not there yet. Are you sweaty? No, I'm not which is weird. <laughs> I'm usually sweating all the time. But uh no, I'm I'm Feeling good. Have a couple notes for myself. Uh, moving forward, you know, just. Little... I think you were great. Thank you. I don't think there was. I don't think anyone would have known this was your first show. Well, I appreciate that. And I appreciate you. And I appreciate everyone out there. I appreciated Tony Zimmerman until he he sold me out on the baby nose thing. But, you know, I've seen it happen. I've got pictures of it. We're going to have to research this. Yeah, definitely. Also oh, yeah. a correction. 
So I had to look this up because someone texted in saying that the state owns American Family Field, not the county, but more specifically, who actually owns owns it is it was so it was opened in 2001 as Miller Park and then it was renamed American Family Field in 2021. The stadium is owned and operated by the Southeast Wisconsin Professional Baseball District, a state created agency that effectively is the Brewers landlord. Uh, so if it's a state created agency, they may be right in that it's the state owns it, but it's t- it's specifically that group it sounds like they are a group that reports back to the state then so. probably but then why was only the the five counties that had to pay for because he only had to do that he didn't have mm-hmm. to push it out it could have just been milwaukee but he decided we'll stick it to him and that was five counties that's why i still refer to oh tommy thompson yeah, like, yeah. that's why i still refer to this park as county stadium Two electric boogaloo because i paid for it there you go. There it goes. My hot take. Hot take. All right. Well, uh, in the last minute, uh, end of an era. So your big thing was is still Lego. Oh, and, yeah. I, and I said it correctly. You did. I appreciate you respecting the brand. But I over the weekend, this just brought back reading about this, some nostalgia for me. So you, your sister and you are probably a generation too old. But American Girl Dolls? We had Cabbage Patch Kids. Okay. Yeah. So American Girl Dolls, that was like my generation, big, big, big. And so for years now, I mean, I think since like 98, they've been owned by Mattel. So it's a much bigger thing than it originally was, but started in Middleton um, uh, with Pleasant Roland. But this over the weekend, it was the last American Girl benefit, which the money from all of the sales goes to the Madison Children's Museum. And like literally the Madison Children's Museum is like considered like the house that dolls built (laughs) because at its peak, they raised like over a million dollars in this one weekend sale, where it's basically all of this inventory of American girl dolls, which are not cheap for like 30% off. And I remember going to that as a kid, like it used to be when I was a kid, it was in like a warehouse in Middleton Yeah, before Middleton is now as built up as Middleton is. And But they had their last one over the weekend. And it's basically because the Children's Museum, I think, is starting to have different initiatives and projects that they want to work on. But this this like fundraiser is 35 years old. It's almost as old as I am. It's definitely younger than me. It's it's younger (laughs) than you. But I just, uh, you know, they expected like between like 3,000 and 7,000 attendees. And it was like an opportunity, especially for like Wisconsin girls or boys. Yeah, to go get Wisconsin any like kids. discounted uh, American Girl doll stuff. Yeah, and so I was end of an era, but I'm I was thinking about that, and then I was thinking, pretty sure my mom still has my dolls, so I won't have to buy new ones for for her. <laughs> Hopefully, she likes them. <laughs> That's the thing. Maybe she'll like Lego. Yeah. <laughs> if you have anything to do with it. Oh yeah, I already got the whole presents picked out. All right. Well. That does it for today. Thank you for texting. Thank you for calling. Thank you for being part of the show. We will be back tomorrow. And actually, Dan Schaefer is going to be here tomorrow. (gasps) He's going to kick off a a new weekly segment with Dan Schaefer where we're going to recombobulate on Tuesdays. Um, So come back then, 10 a.m. We'll do it all again. This has been As Goes Wisconsin.